Welcome everyone. I hope you can all hear us. Prakriti, can you confirm that we are audible on Zoom? Yes, perfect. All right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we realized that our seminar start time, which has been 3.45 for the last 13 years, is not a very Zoom friendly start time <laughs> because Zoom uh, rounds off the inv invited sends off uh, to 3.30 and, and then folks have to hang around and my apologies for that. Uh, but uh, today I'm very excited to have uh, my colleague from CPR, Aditya, uh, speak to us. Uh, we've uh, sort of, uh, the climate team at CPR is, 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 is deeply embedded into uh, India's climate policy space and does a lot of a uh, lot of different things and and Aditya's work on, on heat action plans really caught our eye in the urbanization uh, space, in the urban studies space, because uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, cities themselves are facing so many different types of crises that it seemed, uh, seemed important for us to talk about it. And I can see scrolling down the list of participants today that we have a very, very diverse uh, set of uh, folks coming to listen. So I hope this will be interesting. Um, just to introduce, Aditya, uh, he's a fellow at the uh, Initiative for Climate, Energy and Environment here at CPR, um, and he's been looking at the social and economic consequences of climate impacts in India and South Asia uh, through the policy lens, through the institutional lens, uh, and has a variety of experience in this area, and uh, this, this particular work on, action, on heat action plans is um, exciting and new, and hopefully will show us some pathways to connect with other broader interests, both in climate as well as in the urban space, urban governance, urban planning uh, space. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to, to Aditya to take it forward. And if you if, if if you have any issues with the audio quality or you know there is any such problem, please type it into the chat box or the QA box and I have an eye on this um, and I'll be able to deal with it quickly, hopefully. So welcome everyone again and over to you. Aditya. Thank you so much for Thanks, agreeing Sia. to talk to us. Thank you. Um... Should I just pop the present presentation? Yeah, I, oh, sorry. I, I, yeah. Yeah. So, um, thanks, thanks for joining, folks. Um, I'm hoping to just sort of run you through uh, the broad contours of our heat work. So it's work on heat action plans, and the report was titled "How India is Adapting to Heat Waves." Um, we have um, uh, a co-author of the report, uh, Tamanna, who also works at CPR here, so she'll take the tough questions. Um, I thought maybe I can start a little bit because we have, I mean, especially going through the list online, on Zoom, we have a lot of non-climate uh, people and people from, come on. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have folks from, very diverse backgrounds, right? We have folks from urban and media and public policy and 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 so on. So I think it actually might be useful to start by trying to paint a picture of what climate change is um, and what it means for public policy today, and then narrow it down to a conversation about what heat waves are and what heat action plans do and don't do. And then we'll broaden it out again and have this broader sort of conclusion about what uh, what public policy needs to be doing to adapt to intersecting, multi-sectoral, concatenating, compounding crisis, crises. So anyone who's opening papers every day, I think it has a sense of despondency about it, but it's not all bad. Um, and hopefully we end on a slightly more uh, positive and constructive. Okay, um, is, it, is it over there? Okay. All right. So the the imagery I was alluding to earlier is the idea of a climate battering ram. Um, we were thinking a little bit earlier about how best to convey what's coming down the pike and what's happening right now. And uh, it seemed like medieval siege weapons uh, were the best way <laughs> of, of, uh, of, of uh, talking about climate change. Um, and I mean, it's a very simple, um, it's, it's a very simple idea. Um, the idea is climate change is not just one large shock uh, that hits and rewires the system. It's actually a series of compounding shocks, right? So 
the most important frame one can assign from a public policy perspective is to think of it temporally and then think about all the capacities that need to be built, right? Um, much like battering rams, it's repeated, it's very forceful, and it's capable of taking down large defensive fortifications. Um, and the history of battering rams, which I had a very fun time reading about <laughs> uh, after a conversation with Mukta, the history of battering rams, this is something that's been around since about 800 BC. Um, the history of, history of battering rams is one of constant innovation defensively, right? So a battering ram is a purely a, a attack oriented weapon, but the folks on top of the ramparts that are being battered down are folks that need to think about how to stop this machine, right? So the first innovation was the use of arrows. Um, and so arrows fired from the ramparts. And so then the defensive side had to build roof structures then because the, the roofs were built with wood, um, the, uh, the innovation was the arrows were set alight, and so fire was used. And that meant uh, the roof structure was protected with pelts, with animal pelts, especially wet animal pelts, uh, so that they wouldn't catch fire, right? Um, and so it's a history of constant innovation on both sides. And I think we've reached a point now where we have to think about broad change in terms of how we structure our institutions and policy paradigms to make sure that we're able to take this battering ram on. Um, and so that little picture on the bottom right, um, and I'll, I'll end this sort of extended metaphor in a second, um, but the picture on the bottom right is actually a battering ram, and this is from um, old Assyrian battering rams, uh, again from 850 to 870 BC, which apparently was the heyday of the battering ram. Uh, but there you see on the bottom right, the battering ram has this wonderful little pelt, um, which is covering the whole thing, um, and it has a roof structure on top, and it has uh, people with arrows uh, fighting each other above, right? So it's a it's a very involved and contested space. Um, right now, we're at a point where we haven't begun firing arrows from the ramparts, right? So we're very, very early on in this process. Um, cities are especially important to think about um, because they present a three-tiered vulnerability, right? The first problem is the density, which makes even the slightest perturbation in the force uh, a particularly big one. And you start seeing very large, um, you start seeing very large impacts, um, monetary impacts, loss of infrastructure, long-term disruptions. The second problem is cities are particularly hard to govern. Um, and so when you have a disturbance, it becomes very, very difficult um, to course correct and set up in a way that you're able to resume normal functions. And the third part is cities have inequality baked into them, which makes it very difficult to build any sort of resilience over the long run, right? And inequality is really at the, the core problem, the core poison at the heart of the climate problem is the fact that there's so much inequality. Um, and cities are the embodiment in many cases, in many areas, in many parts of the world, it, it, that becomes the core issue that needs to be dealt with, right? Um, and in particular, over the last year, we've seen this play out quite dramatically. So we've seen uh, flood after flood, city after city. We've seen heat waves. We saw uh, 100 people die in UP, in Balia, and in Bihar. We saw uh, the concentrated loss of life because of heat um, in Nabi Mumbai, in Maharashtra. Um, and we saw Silicon, the Silicon Valley of India underwater just a few months before that, right? Um, but also the fact that climate change is changing the relationship between rural and urban India in pretty important ways in the sense that crop failures in um, rural India, and we saw the imposition of um, import uh, export tariffs on non-basmati rice, for example, and the cessation of wheat exports last year. Um, these are all conversations being had to reduce inflation that ultimately actually pushes, uh, pushes the needle on the urban poor, right? And also at the same time, there are these migratory linkages that are constantly being buffeted by all of these climate, climate shocks between urban and rural India. So in a way, this sort of imaginary we have that urban and rural India exist in two separate uh, universes and aren't connected to each other is kind of collapsing in on itself 
particularly because of all these climate shocks that are reintroducing those linkages in such big ways? Okay, I'm just asking Prakriti to share. So. Oh, okay. Um, I forgot what the next point was. <laughs> you have your oh, right, I have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah, the next point was we're going to get to heat um, and, and talk about heat as a, as, as a core policy challenge in a way of thinking about climate change in a concentrated way and thinking about all the paradigms that need to shift and in what way they need to shift. So I think the first thing to do would maybe to, ju be ju to jump to slide three um, where I'm now going you to can full screen it also, Prakriti. Yeah, please. thank you. That would be great. Well, I'll try and convince you that heat actually just heat on its own. So forget about the flooding and forget all that. Forget about all that other stuff. Just heat on its own constitutes a potential change in India's development trajectory, right? And a few stark, uh, simple stark facts. And so there are various versions of this number floating around. But heat exposed labor in India could constitute up to 75% of the labor force, mainly due to exposure uh, of the agricultural workforce, construction, mining, and a whole bunch of informal service sector jobs. There was this sort of snap analysis that the Hindustan Times also did, um, which put that number closer to 52%. Um, but in any case, that's a pretty big number, right? Between 52 and 75% of the labor force. Um, and then the question becomes how much of working hours could we lose? How many working hours could we lose um, um, in the near future? And so there are different estimates of this. There's this McKinsey Global Institute report that, that's been going around that says it's about 15%. Um, and could constitute 2.5 to 4.5% of GDP. I do, the only reason I put this up here is because it, this number gets a lot of circulation. But I think a lot of people seem to think that this is a bit of an overestimate. Um, the ILO has a much more conservative take on this on an RCP 2.6 pathway, which is actually a less emissions intensive pathway than we have at the moment. And their story is it's going to be about 5.8% of working hours lost by 2030 which is still hugely significant. Um, that is up from about 4.3% of working hours lost in the mid 1990s, right? So it's a 1.5% delta in terms of working hours lost um, in the span of about 30, 35 years. Um, and we've also just sort of totted up all the, ag yeah. You might want to use a mic, Pato. All right, uh, quick uh, clarification. Uh, why is this working hour story so important? If all of us are moving, let's say, to four day work weeks, we're basically cutting down working hours by 20% anyway. So I'm not moving to a four day work week. Well, <laughs> having this luxury. Who's, who's, who's moving to a four day work week? So I'm just killing the yes. work life balance. Four days. So, so, what is the, how does this play out? Is it number in GDP or is it something where you can sort of build it in, given the oh, no, no, build it into what? Uh, so, um, broader stuff, right? Um, you had 48 hour work weeks, you moved to 40 hour work weeks, some places are 32 hour work weeks, and so on. So, forth, right? so that stuff has changed. So, is this uh, reduction in outdoor working hours. Is that something that is relatively strictly correlated right, right. to sort of outputs, not I, even yeah, outputs? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm just wondering yeah. about how that yeah, so sort of the So the methodology of these things is they basically look at the number of minutes per hour one could possibly work in at a given level of heat stress. So there's a paper I'll get to in just a bit, which is this Luke Parsons paper is very heavily cited where they actually sit and calculate in different cities and different humidity levels and different temperature levels. What exactly can you expect from the median member of the labor force in terms of how many minutes they do every hour, right? So it varies between 45 minutes to 36 minutes and that gives you various, uh, various long run estimates. So it's not, not 
it's not the big picture 40 to 32 sort of number, but it's actually in certain jobs, this is the kind of change we're seeing. Um, at the bottom, for example, you'll see in agriculture, you'll see the working hours lost uh, to be about 9.04% by 2030. And this is then just looking at a sample of agricultural workers and how they've responded to heat in different, different ways. And I think this, these are survey-based questions that they've asked, right? So I think that's the methodological basis of this. Um, but overall for agriculture, it's actually quite quite a hairy situation because, and these estimates obviously vary hugely because they're future looking, but I think one could say that between 10 and a quarter of um, a quarter of the productivity of rice, uh, rice, maize, wheat, et cetera, would, would get hit, right? And so this is, this is just the argument to say that this is multi-sectoral um, and it pretty much affects the entire country. And so it's a pretty, pretty um, um, insidious problem in that sense. If we can move to four. Yeah. yeah. Can you move this? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so this is part of this is the the Parsons and um, Parsons et al. study, where they did this sort of they looked at um, looked at how different um, types of jobs would be affected by um, exposure to heat, and then they compared that against um, a whole bunch of other countries. Um, and a lot of this is so this is this is twelve hour work day. Um, and it's population weighted. Um, so what we're seeing here is the fact that India, in terms of loss of competitiveness to a whole bunch of other countries, stands to possibly lose the most. And some of the reasoning there is because there's very little in terms of adaptation. Also, the nature of the heat is different from some of these other places. Um, and so the, the, the broad story here is to make a convincing sort of visual representation of the fact that this affects external competitiveness, right? Um, and so it's not just an internal vulnerability uh, story. It's not just a question of morality. It's also a question of uh, external competition. Yeah. Can we just switch on the mic? It's just yeah. No, because there are people online and they don't know what's happening. No, I just wanted to understand it. Uh, I just wanted to understand the, uh, you know, our workforce, Indian workforce, a lot in the Middle East, and where the heat conditions are uh, enormous. I mean, so are we talking also that the Indian heat conditions are going to be worse than that? Or what is it? Because they're the construction workers and even yeah. the agriculture workers, things like that, they are really exposed to the heat of 45 degrees plus, plus, plus temperatures. Yeah. So just was wondering about that. Yeah, I think it's it's a tough question to answer straight up. I think yeah, the absolute temperature obviously higher than large parts of the country. But in anything like this, the question also becomes how much adaptive capacity you have, right? So how much income is, how much money do people have in their pockets? For example, what are the labor relations like? Can you take a day off when you're heat stressed? Do you have access to healthcare? So the question of better for worse is conditioned, unfortunately, by a whole bunch of variables that make it very difficult to make a straight up comparison. Um, but yeah, in terms of absolute temperatures, you, one could say that it's obviously worse there. Um, next, next slide. slide please. Okay, so long setup, um, and now to sort of the meat of what what we were trying to get to. Um, so. Because we saw all of this stuff, um, you know, we kind of realized that this is probably going to be the leading edge of the climate conversation in the next couple of years because of these broad sectoral um, economy-wide impacts. In fact, they could change the development trajectory. So we thought, why not look at these heat action plans? Um, and they're, they're kind of exciting to look at purely from an intellectual perspective because they're diffusing pretty rapidly, right? 2013, there was only one heat action plan in existence. Uh, and now, um, so Tamana led the effort on this. She went and talked to pretty much every state disaster management agency in the country. Um, and we were able to produce about 37 of them. Uh, now there are 39, two more that have come out since the study was published. Um, and so when you look at the broad landscape of climate policies out there, this puts it on par kind of with the rate of diffusion of 
EV policies, right, which has been this sort of great, big sort of success story in climate. Everyone's trying to do an EV policy. Um, very quietly on the side, everyone's also been producing heat action plans. There's a question about why, right? And it might well be because it's really the last line of defense and it really affects productivity and lives and local governments are sitting there thinking, this is actually important to us. It could also be the fact that there are some very entrepreneurial and technically well-placed uh, international organizations that are working with governments and building capacity on the side that's leading to this diffusion. And also the central government has been pushing the idea of heat action plans, including the prime minister himself. Um, but at the core of the heat action plan, there is this fundamental improbability of what it represents, right? Because it is really, really hard to get right. Um, it requires coordination across a whole bunch of sectors. And on average, we found between eight and 11 government departments implicated in executing actions during a heat wave. It requires behavior changes. So the clothes you wear, the amount of water you drink, how you talk to your employer, when your kids go to school. Um, and it requires large structural changes, right? So how you design your streets, how you retrofit your buildings. So it's a big, big policy task. So a lot rides on the relatively thin shoulders of a heat action plan. Um, um, we also realize that it's kind of at this foundational moment for heat action plans. Um, the National Disaster Management Agency is talking about a model heat action plan. Um, organizations like the Natural Resources Defense Council are currently working with multiple governments, and we're working with them actually on some of this stuff. Um, and so the insights of the study were meant to inform a live policy uh, process. Um, we found HAPs at different levels, 18 at the state level, 11 districts and 10 cities. Um, and we're also thinking of following this up down the line with an implementation evaluation. So I, just to flag that this looks at HAPs as they currently are on paper, rather than looking at how they're being implemented, which is a whole different kettle of fish, right? So we can't make any claims about whether a HAP is effective or not. So you might have a super slim HAP that is, is being implemented to a high degree of efficiency and a very complicated HAP that is not being implemented at all, right? So it's important to sort of have that caveat. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a sort of geographic dis distribution. You see places like Arunachal Pradesh are in there. So it's it clearly shows that heat action plans have spread pretty much mm -hmm. far and wide. And uh, Maharashtra, for example, has a lot of activity right now, uh, mainly because there seems to be something happening within the bureaucracy of Maharashtra that, that leads them to think that there's a high degree of vulnerability. It's also coming a bit from the drought imagination in that central Maharashtra area. Uh, and you'll see the states are particularly well represented, right? So at least at the state level, we're seeing a lot of activity. Um, and the, like I said, there are a few more that haven't been included here, which have come out after the study. Next slide. Um, Jodhpur and Maharashtra. Maharashtra came a few days after the Navi Mumbai thing, or a few days before the Navi Mumbai thing, I should say. Um, this is just a broad sort of, um, this is just to give you a, a, a big picture sense of the way we've structured our assessment framework. And it was structured around um, hazards, vulnerabilities, and exposure. Uh, next slide. Um, actually, you can skip skip these and just move to the yeah sorry actually just hold hold one second um so here um we looked at how the hazard is defined which is to ask whether it involved things like humidity and so on we then took uh, the second part of our assessment framework was actually looking at um the various solutions proposed because once we put together this data set we realized now we have a whole bunch of these haps, what exactly are they proposing from a solutions perspective? And it felt like that was novel terrain to be able to document that. And then the third bit is we looked at the implementation viability, right? Do they build institutional structures? Do they finance them? What is the monitoring evaluation like? So there's, there's a bit that looks at how they address heat, but there's also a bit that looks at whether it's going to be uh, implemented. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a deep dive of what the assessment framework looks like. So on the report, which is available online, you'll be able to see um, this in the annex. We've just pulled out the, the top row here. Um, but you'll see that we look at the definition of the hazard, and that includes things like whether localized temperature thresholds were considered, which is, do they have an understanding of when heat starts to kill people locally and when adaptation limits are crossed? 
whether hot nights, which are hugely important for mortality, or indoor heat, again, hugely important for mortality or humidity, are being considered. And we find there's a lot of variation, right? Most of them don't do this, for example. We look at the social side of it and who's the most exposed, the solutions proposed, like I said, um, and then the final bit of this, which is um, uh, what sort of institutional structures are created for implementation. Next slide, please. Um, and this is this is the summary of the solutions bit uh, when we put all the solutions together, right? One of the first things you'll notice is the fact that it's pretty evenly evenly spaced. Um, these boxes, no single box dominates over the other boxes. And we came into this thinking: heat action plans will put a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of heat infrastructure solutions together, and that's where most of the emphasis will be. But you see, for example, that nature-based solutions um, occupies a pretty big chunk of this in line with IP IPCC recommendation that heat is uh, potentially uh, reasonably well dealt with through nature-based solutions. Behavioral changes are a very big chunk of the pie. And there's a lot of emphasis on institutional capacity building. Information dissemination is not as surprising because that's the core function of a heat action plan to take a heat alert and communicate it to vulnerable populations. One of the things about technological in the bottom right is that we thought there'd be heavy promotion of air conditioning use, which is a maladaptive technique because it increases emissions and therefore increases heat and then creates a recursive loop. But that's not the case, right? So encouraging AC use is that tiny little thing at the bottom right um, and so it's much, much smaller than, say, um, uh, building green roofs or ensuring there's in information dissemination through social media and so on, right? So we got a very different picture when we put all of this together. We realized the broad palette of solutions that heat action plans are proposing um, is actually a, gives, gives a lot of possible instruments to a heat action plan designer and implementer. So you can pick and choose from this and try and adapt it to your local heat conditions, which is which is hugely encouraging, right? So it's not an impoverished base of policy that we're beginning with. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the some of the major strengths, apart from the fact that it's a broad palette, we also try to look at the number of solutions and this is that second point between short and long-term solutions proposed. And for us, we define short-term short solutions as solutions that had an effect for that heat season alone. So think oral rehydration solutions or think a uh, temporary increase in ambulance capacity or moving uh, the maternity ward from the top floor of your hospital to the, which, which, which was done in Ahmedabad to the bottom of your hospital so there was less heat exposure to pregnant women versus longer term solutions like building buildings that are actually heat uh, resistant through some level of passive cooling or changing urban structure, reducing density uh, in, um, in informal settlements and so on and so forth. Um, and we found a balance between these two. So it wasn't stacked very much to short term uh, solution, which is interesting because heat action plans find their origins in uh, public health um, and it's mainly about saving lives. So one would assume whether well, it'd be all about ORS and ambulances, but that really wasn't the case. There's a big urban component which might be of interest to some of the people listening in today. Right, uh, yeah. I wanted to ask. Is it on? Yeah. So I just wanted to ask um, that you know some of these solutions that you have mentioned out here, they were in practice in India before technology actually stepped in like coolers and air conditioners or even fans for that matter. Yeah. You know, I can talk about places in semi-urban, you know, Jhansi and Gwalia and places like that, which actually were exposed to very high temperatures during these summers, um, <clears throat> say in the 70s or even 60s, you know, air conditioners usage had still been very limited in those places, yeah. you know, both because of uh, economic reasons and also because of practice. Uh, so, you know, those solutions which were in, in um, uh, you know, sort of, which were popular at that time or were common at that time, for instance, even having a step well or, you know, having that angan in the middle and, you know, things like that. Are we now trying to recreate those situations because we actually have moved away so much, so far away from that, you know, in the last decades or so, you know, two, yeah. three decades or whatever. So are we trying to sort of come, go back to that and retrieve them? 
or are we now sort of, you know, trying to make an amalgam of the two, bring about, you know, kind of hybrid solutions? Because, you know, I was there in Europe very recently and they were talking about the extreme heat condition that we have all been reading about right now. And they were talking about, you know, behavioral changes, exactly what we have been doing in India for years on end, you know, which has been there part of our DNA in many ways. So I just want to understand, have we moved so far away from what was actually such a practice with us that we now need to sort of look at it from a kind of an academic point of view and get back to it? Yeah. Uh in terms of in terms of intellectual etymology of this stuff, um, it's interesting, right? So some of it is about the step wells. Um, and my colleagues are currently working on looking at how there's a whole bunch of finance to revive old ponds, village ponds and step wells and things through centrally sponsored schemes. Exactly, right? So there's, that's actually uh, in a big way in these heat action plans, it's, it's present. There's also uh, tagging to completely new policy ideas, right? So mixed uh, uh, mixed planning and the creation of a five-minute city, for example, and whether that could reduce heat. So there's this intersection between new urban paradigms and the idea of heat that is that is completely new. Um, the cool roofs business, which is a really big chunk on that uh, on on that, and it's being pushed by Myla Housing Trust in a really big way. Um, is something from the 70s and 80s that exactly so and it's coming back um and the other day it was a really fascinating conversation with someone from the un where apparently in the 70s they had uh, mechanisms where they had a hole in the ground next to a building an underground tunnel through which they pipe no piped air so it cooled underground and you just pump it so all you have is a fan and you have cool air going into a building Right and very energy efficient. Avoid the use of ACs. Singapore is doing this with water, um, uh, and so that's different. So it's a whole mix. It's really drawing from different centuries, from different decades, and uh, and so on. It's kind of, it's 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 interesting, right? Um, it's it's not um, it's not intellectually purist or dogmatic, right? It's really a practical, pragmatic assemblage. Um, so in terms of the weaknesses, and this is these are just impressionistic weaknesses, right? I think people could come up with different ones. Um, but there's very little state capacity building uh, or uh, the emphasis on a research ecosystem or a support ecosystem in civil society, right? And this is common across a lot of climate action planning, not just the heat plans. Um, there aren't a lot of vulnerability assessments that figure into how these solutions are designed. So you often have a sentence like, let's have cool roofs, but where, when, how, how long, you know, green roofs, what is the water cost of a green roof? Can somebody, uh, can somebody in uh, a JJ cluster in Delhi afford the water that is needed for a green roof? So those are the kind of practical questions that we don't actually get to. This particularly plays out in information targeting, where if you're a recent migrant uh, and you're in a, you know, you're not particularly savvy with the phone, you don't have a smartphone, and the SDMA has put out a YouTube short uh, about the heat wave. Are you able to access it? Do you know where to go to get this information? So that level of detail isn't present, right? So I, I, I need to contextualize that solution set has things on paper, but in terms of how to actually implement it, it seemed like there was much a slip between the cup and the lip there. Um, so next slide, please. Um, now let's maybe get into the details a little bit, right? So this is this is potentially hugely important, if, if not somewhat technical. Um, so localized thresholds, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, aren't seen across these heat action plans. A bunch of them talk about it, but very few of them seem to actually create localized thresholds. And what a localized threshold is, is it's a temperature number at which the heat wave is declared. So it says at 41.3 degrees, traditionally we see a massive uptick in heat wave deaths. And therefore that is the point at which all the emergency heat action plan measures need to kick into gear. Um, that requires historical mortality data for that place because essentially what you're predicting is that's the temperature number at which the adaptation limit is crossed, 
right? And 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 community adaptation, historical adaptation, like all these traditional techniques we're talking about, stop working, people start dying. Um, but for that, you need a, a ton of data. So it's not it's not present. Essentially, what we have now is reliance on the IMD's macro na nationwide heat wave alert systems. We don't know where that number comes from, and I've had a conversation with the IMD about this. Where the national heat wave alert uh, temperature thresholds come from, and that's from some study in the 70s or 80s. So it definitely requires. Um, Allegedly from the 70s and 80s, nobody actually knows the date. So that definitely requires updating. Um, one good thing is a lot of these heat action plans talk about secondary impacts, though not necessarily think about ways to address it. And that's things like forest fires that arise from a heat wave. Um, and particularly one is the fact only two of the 37 HAPs use uh, medium to long-term heat projection. So the question there is, are these heat action plans planning for the heat of today or for the heat of 2030, 2040, 2050? Now, if 50% if, if of the solutions proposed in these heat action plans are long-term, such as let's rebuild our cities and whatnot, and let's do shade cover and it takes 20 years for a tree to grow, then you actually need to be thinking about temperature projections 20, 30 years down the line. Um, and so it doesn't really have that. Next slide. Um, just sort of hammering home this vulnerability point, right? and this is what's missing. So only two out of the 37 had vulnerability assessments, which, which means the solutions could be hugely uh, amiss in terms of targeting the right people. And you might have scattershot implementation, right? So think about it, you have a heat wave, you need to know where exactly to take your emergency measures. And you have a city of 28 million, 25 million people um, you cannot distribute your resources evenly across that geography, right? You need to have some sense of where exactly you need to go over the next 12 hours. And that's what a vulnerability assessment gives you. It gives you geographical precision in emergency measures, but it also gives you precision in long term. Where do you build it? Where do you plant the trees, right? So that's, again, where you need a vulnerability assessment. Um, it talks... and. Heat action plans talk a lot about vulnerable groups writ large. So pregnant women, for example, uh, or various occupations such as outdoor workers. Um, one of them, I think the Kerala heat action plan even talks about gig workers, for example, is quite progressive. Um, but there is no policy targeting we saw. So it's, it stops identifying the vulnerable group, but it doesn't create a systematic set of solutions for that vulnerable group. And one of the big kind of issues is that it kind of lumps all women together so on the gender front uh, rather than talking about intersectional risk. So then what you get is these sort of um, sort of large scale statements saying that 50% of the population is vulnerable to this. So what do you do with that, right? Uh, what do you do with, with that? So it's, where does it intersect with caste, for example? Where does it intersect with religious uh, uh, minorities is an important question of figuring out where you need to go to implement your heat action plan. Next slide, please. Just to interrupt yeah. you, so Ritu is asking a question about uh, she's saying some cities are coming up with ward level vulnerability assessments yeah. and how would these be helpful to the HAP, especially considering that they do not necessarily identify population specific vulnerabilities. Did you come across this yeah, kind so, of ward level stuff? So there's two. Out? There's Jodhpur, which has a very nice ward level vulnerability assessment. That actually came out. It's not one of the two here. That came out April. just after the report in April. Um, and I think Rajkot also has a ward, ward level vulnerability assessment. In terms of how effective and useful they are, um, from what we've seen of these, they should be pretty useful, right? Because they actually have a very simple color coding of red ward yellow ward, green ward, go to the red wards. It's very simple. Here are five red wards, implement there, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not sure how rigorous it is uh, because we don't have access to the underlying data, but uh, it seems notionally, at least, it seems like it could be useful. Thanks, Ritu. We'll come back at the end. And if you have more to say, we can bring you in, but we'll let Aditya go on. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, now, this is where the rubber hits the road, uh, the institutionalization, right? This is this is the important stuff, but is far less sexy than the solution side of it. Um, and the HAPs generally cover the fundamentals, right? So they'll establish a nodal officer and a nodal agency, um, which in the heat world seems to be a pretty big deal. So, for example, you would have heard a lot about heat officers in various cities, Um 
Um, they establish clear SOPs for different departments, and that's essentially the, the meat of a heat action plan is SOPs. You know, electricity department has to assure supply to this region for uh, X number of hours a day um, during a heat wave. And we saw that with UP, right? When uh, the electricity was cut off during a heat wave, uh, it became a political issue and it became a, a, a media issue. Um, and also they, they set up a lot of informa information dissemination systems, right? So that institutional structure exists at the heart of it. The big drawback is the financing, which is only to consider financing for some of their solutions, not all of their solutions, but some of their solutions. Uh, and, they're, and, you know, they're exploring pretty interesting uh, areas of finance, right? So for example, the 15 Finance Commission using disaster uh, risk mitigation funds for heat work. Uh, some state disaster management agencies are apparently already using 15 Finance Commission funding um, uh, for heat, even, even though it's not declared as a disaster at the national level. Um, we also see that the consultation mechanisms at the heart of this are pretty impoverished in the sense that most of the time what happens is there's a departmental review where the heads of various agencies get together and have a conversation about whether it was implemented correctly. There, there aren't systematic laid, out, systematic laid out procedures for consultation with the vulnerable groups in these neighborhoods that are getting battered by the heat. So that's, that's a particularly big problem. No independent evaluations proposed in any of the ones we looked at. And this is potentially hugely significant None of the 37 we looked at um, identified the legal source of their authority and, and not even the Disaster Management Act, right? Which, which is presumably broad enough to incorporate something like this, um, which then leaves the question of what exactly is this plan, right? It's floating in the ether. It's a set of broad directions to various government departments. What exactly is it, is it going to do if it's not finance, right? Where does it lie in the bureaucratic pecking order in terms of things I need to implement? Um, and so in, an, in, in a sort of informal conversation with one uh, DM in Maharashtra, he said, well, you know, honestly, there's no political priority. And this is actually pre, pre heat wave that's in Maharashtra. So he said, there's no political priority. There's no money behind it. And the fact is, there's nothing really pushing, pushing us to do this. We have a hundred different schemes to spend down by the end of the fiscal. So why, you know, I, personally, I don't think a lot of DMs across the country are implementing this, right? One person's opinion, but I thought it was kind of, it made, logically, at least it made sense. Uh, next slide. Um, this is something we're working on at the moment. Uh, we are currently going through every centrally sponsored scheme in the country, uh, which is a lot. I want to say it's 66 of them that we've identified uh, as relevant to this. Um, and um, we've gone through the text of these things to identify where they intersect with heat action plan interventions. Uh, just to uh, figure out where exactly the money could be drawn for this. Uh, and there are, huge, there are sort of many layers of intersection uh, that are potentially useful. So this is something that the that that folks uh, implementing heat action plans suggested might be useful in terms of just having a ready recognable toolkit. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is we're very close to the conclusion. Um, and so, the, this analysis suggests a couple of small things that can be done that might actually be hugely useful. The first is the challenge we face in putting all of this together and reaching out to so many of these state disaster management authorities. And so one of the recommendations has been to create a sort of centralized national repository of heat action plans. This is something that NDMA is sort of keen on, keen on doing. Uh, and putting it together, but it might be some months or years down the line because of the sort of bureaucratic processes that need to be followed, because these are truly decentralized plans at the moment, right? Um, um, heat is not a national disaster at the moment, though it has the characteristics of a disaster, especially a large-scale heat wave with many hundreds of deaths, possibly. Um, and so this is yet another live conversation, but we recommend constituting community committee almost immediately to try and figure out whether it can be categorized as a, as a disaster. Um, the rest of it is pretty basic, right? Create monitoring evaluation mechanisms, clarify funding, clarify legal 
foundations of this capacity building and have mechanisms for interstate uh, learning. And this is stuff that's common in, in, uh, across. You could take heat away and substitute pretty much any climate policy or any policy, any social policy. <laughs> you, this is a fungible slide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, please. Yeah, back back to the bashing round. Um, so the 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 question is actually whether in 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 sort of dealing with heat, whether we're now at a point, uh, and there are lots of fancy glitzy solutions out there that are being proposed. Whether it actually calls for us revisiting the old technologies of governance, right? Because heat is a problem, and climate adaptation adaptation in general as a problem makes a very strong case for reviving a bunch of things that seem to have fallen by the wayside. Um, one of them being decentralized governance. It's very difficult to imagine a heat action plan being implemented without a strong ULB, strong panchayat, or a strong state, right? Especially in terms of financing and just bureaucratic capacity. We made this point about vulnerability assessments. We made this point about um, a lack of consultation with vulnerable groups in the revision of these heat action plans. Um, so that local participatory democracy element, again, uh, comes to the fore. Um, the IPCC, you'll see many references to constructing the, the rudiments of a welfare state as being important to staving off long-term climate problems. Um, inequality, like I said, the poison at the heart of this, uh, at, the, at the base of this chalice uh, is the inequality and thinking through science um, uh, science, the relationship between science and the state. And that's just not an abstract conversation. That actually means investing in civil society organizations, research institu institutions that can be independent and are able to inform uh, heat action plans in their implementation, right? Who's going to do the localized threshold determination? Uh, who's going to collect mortality data for 20, 30 years? It can't all be done by one or two central institutions, right? So it's a strong, strong conversation to be had about civil society. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's it. There are a bunch of questions, but I think the questions coming from the audience would probably be more interesting. You do have questions on the slide, on the next yeah, slide? Yeah, yeah. But you want to I, I, no, I, I think we can skip. Okay, yeah. so should we... Yeah, I think okay. we can just... Uh, uh, Prasipi, you can stop the presentation yeah. and we'll sort of move to the discussion bit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so Ritu still has her hand raised. I'll, uh, I know I know everyone in the room has questions too, but while you're gathering your questions, uh, Ritu's hands has been up for a really long time. So let me just get her in. Uh, yeah, I think, Ritu, you can now speak. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry for that hand because I forgot to lower it. <laughs> First thing. No, but if you have something to say, you can say it. Uh, yeah, I just had the one point to make. One of the important takeaway from your report has been this issue about building capacities of, uh, especially the research capacities at the local level, and. Uh, because that uh, while I was going through this presentation and I also read your report before. There were some questions like whatever these HAPs are offering as solutions, they are almost same across different HAPs. So how many of these solutions are backed by evidence? How much is the community participation in creating this, uh, these kind of solutions? And when we say building these capacities, for so what do we build the capacity? I, and I'm referring to a specific research agenda that will be able to help the flexible responses that we are expecting. So actually, I'm from Prayas, and Prayas recently completed a scoping review on heat health research literature from <laughs> India. And therein, we had concentrated on two themes. One was morbidity, mortality, risk associated with extreme heat, and second was adaptation research. And as we had expected, the adaptation research, especially the research uh, on things like what are the community perspectives, what are the uh, different uh, pathways through which these uh, early warnings are communicated and are helpful in uh, having these health outcomes that we are interested in, there is hardly any research on that. So maybe I'll also share that uh, the report, uh, the report link on the 
chat box but i think there needs to be more brainstorming when we say we need to build the capacities we need to be more specific about what kind of research agenda should be there and how do we really build the capacities of these local uh, city level in quotes researchers that would be taking up this research so that there is a direct link between what is being investigated and what is being planned at the different city level HAPs. Thanks. Thanks, Ritu. Kiran, do you want to come in because your question was sort of related to this local capacity point? You can speak. You can unmute yourself and speak. So I'll read his uh, point out. He says if localized data is not available, uh, how can localized responses be formulated? So this question of, you know, sort of adding on to what you were talking about in terms of capacity, but you're bringing in the data point here. So do you want to respond? And then we can maybe take some questions yeah. around the room and then go back to the online folks. Sounds good, yeah. Um, no, thanks, Ritu. Um, actually, the, the your prior support was hugely instrumental in shaping how we thought about this and something we read before uh, we started this work. Um, and, you know, I fully agree with you on uh, shaping the research agenda. I think it's an active conversation. The problem is it has to be multiple research agendas uh, put together because there's a whole met research agenda uh, and a hazard conversation about how the human body uh, responds to things like X percent of humidity in these conditions. What do hot nights really mean? What the differential level of exposure is, say, for men and for women in different trades and occupations, right? That's one whole area. The second part of the research agenda, to my mind at least, is in terms of what you exactly what you pointed out, which is the policy evidence base. Uh, because the data we're using now, for example, urban shade data is coming from Arizona State University's very interesting work on urban shade, but that's using a very different set of trees with a different transparency index for the leaves, right? Um, I, I assume we'd have, you know, different trees in different levels of shade, different shade structures. So at that level of nitty gritty, uh, we need to start building this. And so this is ground zero, right? So there is there is really very little, and it's something we looked at in terms of how much evidence exists for all of these things, right? In terms of green roofs, what exactly is the average water implication for a green roof to be set up? Because then every single heat action plan. And if you live in, um, in Masudpur, in Delhi, you get water once in 15 days, uh, right? And so how, <laughs> and, and your electricity cost per unit is 14, 15 rupees a unit, right? It's three, four times the unit price of electricity that I pay because it's a stolen connection from the nearest neighborhood, right? So where exactly are we coming off, you know, saying all of these things that's actually an open question, really requires grounded research. Uh, uh, so this is really as much as anything a rights and justice issue in terms of figuring out how these heat action plans uh, should be structured. And the third bit is understanding whether these institutions function at all. Um, and that's something we're hoping to do and we're working on right now in terms of actually seeing, okay, do these coordination mechanisms meet? Why don't they meet? Where is the financing coming from? What are the six things we can fix to make sure that long-term solutions are being implemented, right? So that's a basic. So this, is, I think, is, to my mind, at least a broad kind of the, the broad survey. Um, there's one bit about heat and politics that that is, again, completely untouched, but what it's doing to migratory patterns, what it is doing to agricultural unrest, what it is doing to water um, so there's that set of conversations, and I definitely don't know how it's filtering into the political system in terms of electoral. Uh, I'm sure there's some linkage, but uh, but in general, that's that's a frontier that political sciences has not breached just yet in terms of figuring out how these micro signals from multifarious crises are actually transmitting into macro politics, um, and that's that's a broader sort of uh, research agenda. Um, yeah. Let me pause. Then. Yeah, I think let's take any questions from the room. We have some. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first thing, thank you. Uh, my name is Surbhi. I work with an organization called International Innovation Corps. Um, uh, 
firstly appreciation on doing such a detailed uh, research and this is probably lack of my understanding of the space as much i just wanted to understand we have something called the climate action plans right overall and heat is one part of it are you also looking at the other um, so you have cold waves and you want to have other kind of issues coming in and if these plans are talking to each other or if they're contradictory secondly something you just spoke about which is the politics of climate are we while these are um, all about mitigation or response does this also capture what happens when you have very heavy migration and you have to because of heat waves um, and you have to rehabilitate or provide support yeah. Any other questions? Maybe we can take a couple of uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, allow me to speak in English rather than in English, right? Uh, I'm, I'm glad at the end, somewhere, because I, I, I was kept expecting what is going on. At the end, you made it, uh, small remarks about Masudpur, right? I'll, I'll, I'll come to the Lisha, but that explains everything. Uh, the other side of the story. Uh, climate change, ke mein aap jo bolte hai, heat action plan. I think it's a futuristic. Then ILO has come in. ILO ka pehle reference aata hai ki wo ye data data, data se data is, data is coming from all over the world. All ye data jo hai, ye salaried sections jo hai population ka hai. Jo AC mein baithte hai, ya pankho ke niche hai. ये उनके लिए वो मसूदपुरी वालों के लिए नहीं है ये जो इंडिया जो ज्यादा मसूदपुर है सारा ओवर एक छोटी सी बात कहना चाहता हूं जब से हमारी आजादी हुई आज तक कहते हैं घर घर में बिजली का बल्ब होगा बल्ब होगा बिजली नहीं होगी पानी का नल होगा नल होगा पानी नहीं होगा अगर पानी आया दिल्ली दिल्ली आप दिल्ली इज द कैपिटल ऑफ द गोल्ड कैपिटल राइट इंडिया कैपिटल है मैं दिल्ली का रहने वाला हूं आप भी यहां रहते हैं पानी जो आता है नलों में सारे फिल्टर करके पीते हैं दिल्ली में पानी फिल्टर होके पिया जाता है और दिल्ली में अगर पानी फिल्टर होके पिया जाता और मसूद जैसे शहर जगह पानी पीने को नहीं मिलता तो बाकी इंडिया में क्या हो रहा है तो यहाँ क्या आता है यहाँ पर क्या आता है रीबिल्डिंग द वेलफेयर स्टेट रीबिल्डिंग द वेलफेयर स्टेट में आप क्या कहते हैं आप जो हम देख रहे हैं कि जो स्टेट है आप एक बेटे तो कितना कुछ के ये होना चाहिए वो होना चाहिए मैं आम ना आम आम ग्रास रूट वर्कर आम ग्रास रूट वर्कर मैं आपको बताना चाहता हूँ कि हिंदुस्तान में हीट प्रॉब्लम नहीं है एट द मोमेंट राइट नाउ राइट नाउ फ्यूचरिस्टिक में कहोगे तो बहुत ज्यादा होगी तो तब प्रॉब्लम होगी लेकिन इस वक्त इसमें इस वक्त प्रॉब्लम क्या है की प्रॉब्लम है सबसे बड़ी प्रॉब्लम इकोनॉमिक सर्वाइवल इन जनरल एंड सर्वाइवल इन पार्टिकुलर लोगों की सबसे बड़ी समस्या है कि हम मेरे पास वो लोग आज ही मिला मेरे पास जैसे जो गांव से आया है झारखंड से कैसे साहब काम करने के लिए आया तो मैं उनके आई आई मीटिंग है साहब अस्सी रुपया मिलता पूरे दिन का बारह घंटे काम करते हैं खाने को रोटी नहीं मिलती है तो हम इधर को आ गए दिस इज इस केस हम गेम थोड़ी इस केस अस्सी रुपया सारा दिन बारह घंटे काम करके मिलता है लोगों को इकोनॉमिक सर्वाइवल की जरूरत है हीट की नहीं है हीट की समस्या वो कहते कितनी भी हीट दे दे मेरे को रोटी दे वो कहता रोटी दे मुझे और कुछ नहीं चाहिए जैसे कि मुझे दे, पानी पंद्रह दिन में दे दे भाई पानी तो दे दे हिंदुस्तान में ये हो रहा है कुछ तो दे दो भाई भगवान के वास्ते कुछ तो दे दो कभी भी दे दो दे दो तो यहाँ की समस्या भारत की समस्या साउथ ईस्ट एशिया की समस्या ईस्टवर्ड एशिया की समस्या लिविंग साइड चाइना एंड कोरिया जापान एंड वियतनाम बाकी की जगह की समस्या जो है मिडिल ईस्ट से आगे आगे वो ये है सर्वाइवल इकोनॉमिक सर्वाइवल के सिर्फ भूख की है आगे कोई आई एम सॉरी मैं दिस इज तो नो नो वी गेट दैट आई थिंक अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल आर कंसर्नड अबाउट आई एम सॉरी आई आई स्टॉप इट हियर सो हीट इज यस इट इज अ फ्यूचरिस्टिक प्लान एंड इट शुड बी देयर इट शुड बी कंसर्नड बट राइट नाउ इट हार्डली मैटर्स हाउ हॉट इट इज इट इज व्हाट आई गेट फॉर माय फॉर माय बेली दैट्स इट ठीक आदित्य को रिस्पॉन्ड करने देते हैं ये 
that's that's not a small thing that's today right you know so it's it's not because of heat because of heat right so there are we are at a point now where in the next 10 years if we have a major heat wave and it intersects with humidity and we have a whole bunch of factors that intersect and we lose a thousand lives or two thousand lives i wouldn't want to be in a position where we've said actually this is a problem for 2030 or 2040 because it has happened already ahmedabad 840 deaths right um it happened in yeah, andhra pradesh ha huh, bihar me andhra pradesh me 2500 deaths 2015 right we're already there and you look at europe you know 70000 80000 if you look at the all cause mortality numbers and put them together it is here the problem is here and if you, the problem is we don't count the numbers right if someone looked at the 2021 heat wave hottest march in the history of india in 122 years our wheat productivity fell by 6% right wheat ex wheat, wheat exports were stopped um and then we had a pretty hot rest of the summer also. Heat waves that went on for about two and a half, three months across the country. 75% of the land surface area of the country affected by heat waves at some point or the other. That was last year. We don't know what the dollar rupee figure of the damages is on that. So because we don't have that, then we think, well, okay, this is not a present day problem. It is a problem, but we can't see it because we just don't have the data to see it. So there's a difference between the two things. Hmm. No, I am, I am the demon. Okay, I okay. It's a good problem. What That's good. <laughs> sir, sir, we so, so, request you that this discussion can happen with the speaker afterwards yeah, because we have lots of questions have, coming in. It's a very involved discussion. I'd also like to say that these two are not problems. These two are not one problem. problem. <laughs> Yeah. So that's the link. I mean, if a construction worker has a rosy roti ki problem and he has to wear the heat of heat, then the yes, yeah. problem highlight in the slides mein jo karna chahre the shayad, that was the problem. That they are not only dealing with all the problems that they're already dealing with, on top of it, they're dealing with extreme heat also, which affects their productivity and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we'll, we'll park this now and we can come back to it offline after the talk. We have three uh, questions from the... Any more questions from the floor here? If urgent questions, do you want to add? Yeah, maybe we'll, we have three more questions from uh, the online space, which we'll take after you. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm Nivas and I'm doing PhD yes. at uh, Center for Political Studies. It should be green. It should be green. Yeah, oh, okay. so uh, my question concerns the impact of heat wave on the world of the society uh, to some extent you have also uh, touched that and you told how people or resident of Masudpur is facing problem of water similarly a lot of uh, uh, basic swimming amenities is missing or get accidented during the heat wave like uh, uh, most of these localities have bore bales as a source of water which get drained and also uh, their working capacity reduce like in a big if they work for uh, five or six days they can't work in heat regularly and they miss their work as well and there's a lot other problems like uh, uh, toilet uh, hygiene uh, garbage all of these issues get exacerbated in uh, during heat so does the current heat action plan which you have touched upon address these issues and if yes then how does it uh, like address these problems mm -hmm. and also uh, how can be the current heat action plans can be i mean uh, improve improvise to in include these problems and yeah. address yeah. thank you thanks can i bring in uh, mas dikshit who has a similar question about health and wellness impact you can yeah. unmute yourself and ask yeah yeah hi uh, this is mas here i work with global building performance network and uh, we've been working on one project which aligns uh, closely with the heat action plan, which is uh, regarding health and well-being for people in the affordable housing sector. So what I wanted to understand is um, I, I see some sort of um, correlation between the heat action plan and affordable uh, housing, because I think in the chart that you showed, there was a major uh, element of buildings in it. 
So uh, just wanted like if you could elaborate a little bit more on how it impacts health uh, of the people living there, because we talked about people who are going to be uh, the masons and working class community, but also how heat plan impacts people living in homes that are not healthy or the ones, the homes that do not sustain heat. So uh, just if you could um, yeah, talk a bit on that, that would be great. Thank Sorry, you. this is a question about PMAY specifically? Mm, not PMAY in general, but like affordable housing sector um, where the design decisions, uh, uh, when I say design decision, it can be passive, it can be selection of materials, um, th does the heat action plan capture that as well? Like, do you see an intersection of the heat action plan and the decisions taken in the building sector uh, yeah. intersect? So that's what my question is. Yeah. Do you want to take these two since they have some? Yeah. So on the first one, the specific point where urban poor filter into heat planning is through the vulnerability assessment, right? So normally the parameters that are included include um, income levels, uh, type of job, and whether there is some sort of HR policy where one can take leave or not from that kind of job. So if you're a construction worker, presumably not, right? And presumably you don't have the labor capital relations are so skewed that you don't have the ability to argue for leave or any sort of compensation or insurance access to electricity, access to water, exactly what you said, right? Because those are the two things you need during the heat wave. Um, and so that's what a vulnerability assessment does, but only two of the 37 have vulnerability assessments. So we're left in a situation where you have a very extensive, broad palette of heat action plan solutions, but you don't actually know where, where to target them, right? So that's the specific spot. So what you're calling for is essentially more robust vulnerability assessments. And People like NRDC, for example, Irade uh, in, in Delhi, they're actually um, uh, pushing that conversation in pretty pretty big way. Yeah? Um, in terms of uh, affordable housing, um, it's not a conversation that the HAPs are having to a great degree um, because the housing conversation sort of sits apart. Mainly housing comes into it in terms of passive cooling. Uh, it doesn't actually talk a lot to what is happening in to housing in India at the moment, right? And the direction housing in India has taken, especially the affordable housing conversation. And that's really an area that's sort of ripe for intervention uh, from the urban space, at least. Um, now, for people like the World Bank, for example, are thinking about how to influence the PMAY scheme to make it slightly more heat resilient. And they have a bunch of plans about energy efficient cooling through fans and so on, which they're trying to push right now. Um, but this is a blank space in, in a lot of ways. It's not an active conversation between these. All right. I'll just take the other two people whom I've uh, sort of brought into the online space. Uh, Aslam Sheikh and Ajit Jadhav. Do you want to just unmute yourself and ask your questions? And then I have another question from the floor. So, Aslam, do you want to go first? You have to unmute yourself and ask. Hello. Yeah. You're listening? You're listening? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, in a metro city, a lot of heating is developed due to electricity, transportation, and FSI building. Well, nowadays, there are high rise building is there. So the heat problem definitely comes. How you go and to control it? Why don't you apply a nature-based cooling system, which is cheap one, according to, according to me? We can use a different method. We have to display, but I don't have right now. We can get earthen pot we create here on the top of it. Some uh, earthen pot for clear uh, cooling down the temperature. And corner of the building should be we uh, keep weighty so that then uh, blow, uh, blow of air will go naturally and get, get cooled down. This is the, my suggestion for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Ajit Chadav, do you want to also ask your question? And then uh, we have some questions from the room as well. You can unmute yourself. Oh. 
Okay. So I'll ask your question. Uh, basically, Ajit wants to know whether there's an effect, whether there's a relationship with land surface temperature. Yeah, um, and that's, I think, the more technical sort of question. About so, my great grandmother. Right <laughs> that's okay. You can say that. Uh, why don't you ask your question? Can, can you please speak into the mic? Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we we are uh, founders of NGOs <clears throat> which work in Sanghamu. And uh, when we talk about uh, cooling and housing, these are urban slums. Yeah. And, and they definitely need cooling. And we are surprised for the last 10 years we were able to manage it. How we increase in the cooling to air conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And connected to the electricity. Now, when you speak, I'm just, it's a it really is a concern for us. Because obviously the air conditioners create more heat. You know that that system. So is there anything you need to think about that these slums, for example, they should have a structure of construction or you know, like you're talking about the cooling roofs or whatever. Maybe some policy directive given that we you know they're legalizing them, you know, yeah. some structure there that we can do something. And mitigate the effect of, uh, let's say, I don't even know the terms, but I am so glad that you've taken up this very essential topic. Mm. But Thank you. Yeah. I just want to do it. Yeah. Is there anyone else in the room? Anyone that has questions? Because, yeah. go ahead. Thank you. There isn't one who has been uh, answering my question. Like, 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 so, like, again, like uh, a couple of you guys said, uh, the main priority of the board, kind of now taking it forward, it's just our own research, I guess. Okay. I'm curious to understand that the other report mentions, you have some mention of um, how it will focus a bit more on the short term trends in terms of this how all that happens. And uh, I'm trying to get you understand from you. How do you think, like, what lack in terms of the system standard, which especially with respect to health? Um, because a lot of what we saw in the report and other HAPs mentions uh, stuff on, say, you know, implement cooling shades and stuff like that in hospitals. But system standard for health would be a, a larger space, right? So yeah. just trying to understand if. You have some thoughts on the system strengthening for HAPs. Yeah, yeah. Can you take one more since it's sure. related? Uh, Ritika, uh, can you, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, you're talking about a larger policy roadmap. Hi. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, I think my colleague Sharvari is also there. I'm, I am from Microsafe Consulting. And just on the lines of, you know, the heat action plans and the, the issue that you raised of the weak institutions and the failure of these HAPs, right? So just wanted to understand your view or suggestion in terms of, do you think the existing HAPs and the guidelines of NDMAs which are in place are viable enough solution to this problem? Or do we need like entirely a new sort of a roadmap or guideline in place that caters to the institutional roles and responsibilities and more like intersectoral and interdepartmental collaborations in general? So, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thanks, Ritika. I think there's a bunch, yeah. And then we have another round. Right. So, two questions. I think the one from Aslam and your question about cooling. And so, I think uh, Aslam's point was about passive cooling and nature-based solutions being important. And you're pointing out the reality that it's, it's, it's AC-driven. And this really is a hugely complex question, right? Uh, from the climate side, like I said earlier, the big worry is that this is going to drive up emissions, especially if we have hundreds of millions of people um, across Africa and Asia now coming online, getting reliable access to electricity and, and, um, and um, uh, driving up emissions and then global heat. That's one side of the conversation. But the other side of the conversation equally is the fact that this cannot and probably should not be stopped. Because if you're talking about unbearable heat, it is very difficult to say it's real field 52 degrees and you've been in a heat wave for four straight days. You're not able to work. Your income is falling, but here's passive cooling for you, right? Um, and so it's, for, for a country like ours, it's extremely important to figure out where the line is. My personal sense is 
that it will come down to super energy efficient cooling uh, and air conditioning where that is possible. Obviously, we have now reached a point where we can sort of say we're dealing with the HFC issue. But in terms of the carbon emissions from air conditioning, we're a long way off. That means reduce A, switching out the electricity grid and making it more renewable centric. Um, from like the limited conversations I've had, it seems like hydrogen is not really going to be able to play a role uh, in this. So then it means connecting back to the grid as a whole. Um, and how does that intersect with the battery storage conversations? An open question. And the second part of it is actually just changing like the actual technology of this to make it hyper energy efficient. And it might be smaller ACs. Maybe the cooling redu reduction we're looking at like, right now, we're in what, 23 degrees, uh, 22 degrees. Maybe we're looking at a reduction from uh, 41 to 37, 38, right? I don't know what this looks like, you know, it's, but that's a conversation that's not yet started and should start. Is the plan, Michael? So, uh, I mean, uh, the conversation also because uh, we are working uh, on the ground and we do understand that uh, uh, migration becomes an interconnected yeah. issue. Yeah. We would like to at least reduce it. Because uh, it is, yeah, the conditions are very bad. Yeah. We've seen the food poisoning. All of them are the same. There is no difference here. There is no water. We've been working 15 years. We've been buying water. Yeah. That has been a <coughs> drinking. Yeah. I think global quality, that is you and I can understand. Yeah. The tube well doesn't work. The water lines are not there. They are private contractors, all that goes. And despite and in spite of all the governments coming in and saying, Free electricity, free water, but like we also said that the rates are so high, what we, you know, all these eyewash political games is not something we are, you know, we don't talk about and we're not concerned about it. It's back to the matter is that I think the base is that we do not want the migration. Yeah. And everything gets uh, connected. That's, yeah, <laughs> maybe for my colleagues on the urban side, actually, because they think about this more, but yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I take that. I take that point. Um, in terms of the land surface temperature thing, you know, I have I actually don't really know the atmospheric dynamics of uh, heat wave well enough to comment on it, so I won't. Um, uh, in terms of the system strengthening stuff, um, and I think you know there are two questions about uh, system strengthening uh, approach. Um, it's I think it's useful to think about how these heat, heat action plans are constructed. And they're basically negotiations with a bunch of departments. And like, like all climate plans, they are interdepartment uh, negotiations that happen about what can we conceivably do um, and what is within our comfort zone. And then you create an amalgamation, which becomes the heat action plan or the state action plan on climate change or the district disaster management plan and so on. Um, that uh, then leads to an inability to think about long-term system transformation, right? If you're talking about completely rewiring your cities, unscrambling the egg and saying, okay, let's make this more heat resilient, you actually need to have a vision for this. It can't be like only bottom up. It has to be a conversation there. And that's where, that's where the gap is, right? And one of the key problems, that's why we highlight this, there isn't a lot of in-state capacity building because a lot of the bureaucracy in a lot of states don't know what a heat action plan is, right? So it has to start at that super basic level before a vision can be built because this has to be a bottom-up vision, but it has to be a vision that operates top-down some level. So how do you do it? Um, I missed a question. I think it was your question about the SAPCCs and the DDMPs and are they talking to each other? Heat operates more or less unto itself. It has some linkages outwards with uh, the SAPC DDMC, but they're all completely separate documents, right? Um, and so that's that's really, it creates, there are multiple policy documents doing the same thing in different ways. Um, and so there are multiple forums. The question is which forum is the most active and the most able to pull, pull, pull the agenda through. Um, and there's been some debate about whether heat action plan should be folded into this or not. But then there's an argument to be made that these all have different bureaucratic lives, right? So if heat action plans are enjoying their moment in the sun and this is like the document, then let it be, right? Let, let the heat action plans run. And then some other day it'll be the SAPCCs and then you use the SAPCCs, right? I think there's a little bit of hedging 
that's needed in terms of policy entrepreneurship <laughs> when it comes to climate resilience. We'll figure out the paperwork later as long as like, the people on the ground are able to, you know, so that's that's maybe too liberal approach. And I understand the concerns of multiple forums, but anyway, uh, separate story. I, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I think I've more or less touched upon anything unless there's something I'm really missing. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a couple of questions uh, online. Uh, I, Pushpa, maybe you can go first because your question is clarificatory. You can unmute yourself and ask. Unmute? Where? Unmute? Yeah, you're unmuted. Unmute. We can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm, I have also disappeared. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'm a little uh, not so tech savvy, you know. So earlier, Mukta used to unmute us and we didn't have to look for it. But now we have to look for it. <laughs> I did. I, I did unmute you. you. I, my question is... <laughs> I mean, my question... And these days, I have to also look. Where is Ray's hand, you know? Every time the format changes. You should, you should just WhatsApp. You just WhatsApp me next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just in the same way, I'm trying to understand the nature of heat, okay? Um, India was always a hot country, uh, North India. Uh, if Europe becomes hot as it did in this summer and previous summers, it's unusual. It's not a hot country, it's a temp temperate climate. So when I was growing up, uh, uh, it used to be hot as hell. Uh, and Num and we used to measure every day, read the temperature in the newspaper, and we used to count how many days above 40 degrees were recorded in a month or in the summer. That was the uh, criteria for saying, oh, it was very hot this year. And also there used to be something called lu, hot wind, and people used to get heat stroke and used to dry, die that we don't experience anymore. So the nature of heat has changed. So what has changed? What is incorporated in the heat index? I'm not saying that it's not a crisis, climate crisis. Climate crisis is taking place, but understanding that crisis is important for all normal people, not just experts. So what is it in the heat index which tells us that it's hotter now? And by the way, I am from that district where lots of people died in Balia. And every summer vacation, we used to go to our uncle's house in the summer vacation, and there was no electricity. Electricity would come once in a while, like you are experiencing in Mathurpur, no water, no electricity, hand fans, and we survived. There were coping mechanisms. So it was, it used to feel very, very hot. Uh, so please explain to me why it is hotter now. Yeah. Um, okay, do you want to take that? Because it's like a very particular question. Yeah. Um, I, or you want to sort of send her a link or send us all a link to send, some primer. Let, him, some let him talk, let him talk. <laughs> 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 he's, he's looking like, oh my God, where do I start? No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, go. No, I actually, I, I was, uh, what I was desperately Googling was an op-ed uh, that, that um, so a colleague of mine who thinks about this stuff, um, and I wrote this op-ed in Hindustan Times, he's an emergency room doctor, right? So we're wondering <laughs> what, why is this heat different from the heat of our childhood? Um, and one of the things he suggested in this was, uh, and his name is Sachit Balsari. Um, he... Uh, he seems to think that there's something going on firstly in terms of how the human body is reacting to extremely high levels of heat, right? So the nature of the classic heat stroke case is changing. It's not a multi-day affair. It can be shorter than that, right? And also because the heat is generally high. I think this is right. Yeah. We're all kind of running out. Okay, okay. Uh, because, the, because, because the heat is generally much higher, um, what's happening is even an instance of not being able to step out of harm's way um, and being forced into the firing line has much larger health consequences, right? So it's more punishing if you make a mistake. Um, and that's, that's one of the problems. So the margin for error is much, much lower, right? Um, this is not as 
the malfires isn't as low as like stepping into a cyclone and you're gone, but it's getting to that point where if you make a couple of bad decisions, you end in a place that's quite uh, quite bad, right? What that does from a policy perspective is shifts the onus back onto the information you have and the knowledge you have about the peak. If you don't know your margin for error is decreasing in terms of decision you make, decisions you're making on a day-to-day -day basis, and whether you send your kid out to school or whether your elderly grand grandmother does take that walk in the evening, um, then you're more likely to commit that mistake and then you end up with, with the heat that's right. And he has this very nice line and he says, mm, uh, it's not the heat of our childhood was um, the heat ration that that we experienced or various types of heat cramps. Now it's deadly, right? That's that's the that's the basic 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 difference. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Hi. So, you know, just related to this, uh, my question is, how much of information dissemination are we, be, are we being able to do either, you know, via policymakers or government or people in positions and administration about the nature of heat that we are experiencing, number one. And number two, I mean, when many of us actually question how is this heat different? I mean, many of us have questioned about this. Um, and actually, this in many ways has been a revelation to me, particularly this last answer that you gave, that what we experience in our childhood is actually different from what we are experiencing today. In fact, that I think is the crux, which needs to be talked about much more than you know what we have been used to so far. Obviously, it's got such long-term climatic uh, impact uh, something to what you were saying that, you know, it really doesn't matter, but you know what is happening, what we're seeing in the mountains, what we are seeing all over the world, we're also seeing oceans rising and what could be the long-term impact of that? You know, all of us have maybe some kind of a smattering knowledge of this, but I think, you know, there should be a much more concentrated, focused discussion around it because our very survival will probably depend on that. No, no, there are a few people. I'll give you a chance. I'll give you a chance. There are a few related questions. So, uh, Mansi has been waiting for a while to answer, ask very specific questions. So, Mansi, do you want to just come in and ask them? Yeah. What, hi. What you need? Um, so, basically, I just wanted to understand whether the plans um, um, have considered these things. Uh, one is heat island effects. Uh, which are very, um, you know, something that one talks about a lot, especially in urban settings. Um, then reduce taxes to resources like water and electricity, uh, even in, when they're thinking of solutions or thinking of, you know, what is to be done to tackle the problems. Or do the plans assume that you, you uh, resource availability is at current levels of access? And uh, then uh, one more question was, uh, how much do these... Uh, Haps from adjoining areas talk to each other, whether they do, uh, should they, what is the value in it and whether it's a possibility, you know, to look at it uh, in a larger perspective, in an area-wise perspective, instead of just very uh, administrative, um, you know, um, approach. And uh, just one question, one more additional question, because I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know if I missed it in your uh, presentation earlier, but how much is the biodiversity and impact of uh, this rising heat uh, levels on biodiversity and their uh, concurrent impact on our lives considered, uh, whether it is considered at all in any of these plans? Thank you. So a related question by Shubham is on the effect of extreme temperature exposure on disease-specific morbidity. Huh? So a related question online is the effect of this temperature, extreme temperature exposure on disease-specific morbidity. So sort of, again, very specific, uh, you know, impacts of this kind of uh, heat. So just adding that onto your plate. I know it's already got a little complex in terms of your response, but do you just want to take these, yeah, take sure. these first? Um, so in terms of the information dissemination systems, right? So the, the, the point you were making, um, yeah. Okay. So 
the information dissemination systems, they establish very clear hierarchies and structures from the IMD out to the state government level and to the various nodes of the bureaucracy down to the district level. The part of that chain that is the hardest uh, to map and understand is whether it's going from the bureaucratic structure into society and the vulnerable people, right? So are the most vulnerable people getting these messages? Are the capacity building workshops that are being planned going to the people in uh, slums and talking to them about it, right? So those are the those are the questions we don't know. Tamana, do you want to come in for 30 seconds about agriculture and information dissemination? Um, so I might have a little bit of a different opinion uh, from Aditya on this. Uh, the HAPs do talk about information dissemination uh, to a certain level where they talk about how this, this information will, leave, uh, will reach different departments. But uh, my concern primarily is if, the, if it is reaching the agriculture department in particular, is it reaching the farmers? Because by and large, we see that agriculture department has been losing capacity in terms of workforce. Uh, the number of extension workers it has. So the extension workers are the primary uh, information givers to the farmers. Now, when we have, instead of 40, we have one extension worker working in a block. How does that information reach mm. the farmers? And then there's the digital divide. So most of the information is going through phones, uh, going through mass media. Is the farmer actually able to, uh, you know, understand the information? Uh, but the HAP does go into the longer behavior changes when it uh, includes these heat advisories in the education curriculum, for example, for children. Or it, uh, it builds capacity to the ASHA workers to actually disseminate this information to the village workers. So uh, it is for us to see now how uh, it is being implemented. But on paper, while it lacks in certain ways when it comes to the last uh, person who is using the information, the information channels are set in terms of long-term and short-term information dissemination. Yeah, and Tamana is working on a piece on agriculture and information dissemination around heat waves, which is like a bit of a blind spot, especially with all these macroeconomic numbers you're seeing in terms of rice loss and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the nuance of this, right? Urban heat island effects, reduce access to water and electricity. Do these haps get to that level of granularity in thinking about what the solutions are? Um, no, they don't. They assume um, resource avail availability. So it's kind of an order. So the way it's usually phrased is ensure water supply or ensure electricity access. Um, but the fact that the national uh, power system is being overloaded and they're trying to push coal rakes through the railway system at breakneck speed to make sure that the heat wave is being met with, they don't think about that kind of system dynamics. And we saw that in March last year, right? So we saw that there were power cuts everywhere because they couldn't get enough coal to the plants to meet the spike in electricity demand, partially because of the heat wave, partially because of the COVID lockdown being lifted, right? So that kind of sort of big picture sort of like this is how the system um, functions is not there. That's also because we don't know. So, you know, a lot of these heat action plans were written before last March. Now we understand there's a capacity constraint. So a lot of this is also learning by doing. So it's a good start, but I think the layers of nuance that we can build as we learn about things. How much to have talk, talk to each other? Um one of the big questions is actually how a state HAP talks to a district HAP talks to a city HAP and whether the three are giving contradictory pieces of information because sometimes, it, and this is something we haven't looked into, it's just a sort of question we have because sometimes these HAPs are written by different people, right? And, and they, they come out at different times. So HAP synchronization in a geographic area is actually an important area of research that we haven't done. And Honestly, even if anyone in the audience uh, wants to pick that up, that's actually a very, very important area because now you're seeing multi, multi-tiered heat action plans. Uh, biodiversity impact is not something we saw a lot of conversation about, uh, as as far as I know. And in terms of uh, disease-specific, um, uh, disease-specific impacts in terms of morbidity. Um, there's a lot of sort of broad mentions of the fact that in vulnerable groups, they will identify the fact that people pre-existing ailments, uh, diabetes and so on, 
are more likely to be affected by this. So that sort of general recognition that I don't know how policy actionable it is because a person with a morbidity is probably going to um, need the same level of care as someone without a morbidity, but they right? so, uh, from a policy perspective, I don't know. But there are some countries that are actually establishing temperature thresholds not on mortality, but on morbidity. Um, so increase in outpatient uh, in outpatient intake uh, is being seen in some instances as a threshold for determining a heat wave rather than that's that's just it makes a more sensitive sort of setting but that's i mean cutting at state of the art heat action plan stuff so yeah Okay, just to, to just take it back to the cities more closely. So there are some city action plans and the heat action plans, and there are state heat action plans. Right? Uh, when you look at them, what would you say are the key sort of differentiators between the city action plan? What do they focus on that's over and above the state? And when you compare across different uh, City action plans, do you see any major difference? For example, Jodhpur, a particular geography, Surat is a different geography. Um, do you see that difference in what you are seeing there? Or I noticed you had a Gujarat, three or four Gujarat cities had heat action plans. Uh, are they similar to each other? Or are they specific to different things? I mean, that's one set of just based on what you're looking at. And secondly, more broadly, did you sort of have a sense of the kind of actions that were being planned or suggested as part of city heat action plans? Did you find that there were actions that could be implemented by city governments or would they require sort of in, uh, other agencies, state agencies, etc., to act in the city, but it's not action by the city. Uh, I, would you have a sense of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you, sir. I really saw the temperature, and it's my uh, uh, say observation, so to say, um, population, global population is on the rise and nobody can deny it and nobody can arrest it. This rise in world population, nobody, nobody is interested rather to arrest this rise in population. And the wildfires, the forest fires all over the world have grown in, in, in a larger sense. Or pehle se jada ho rahi hai. Or agle saal is se bhi jada hone wali hai. Kyo? Ki temperature rise ho. Canada ka itna mere bache rahi bohaan rahate hai. Canada ka itna saath nahi hai jara papar hai. Toronto to Calgary. Kitna bada distance hai. Kahi bhi saath nahi liya jara. Kati saath hi nahi lena muskal ho raha. Na andar na bahar. Itni fire wahan hui hai is saal. Europe mein bhi hui hai. Or agle saal temperature aur upar hooga. Is saal aur jada fire hooga. Is ka matab rising temperature is on the way. On the way, there, there's no way to we can cut it down. The, the point is, do you think can this rise global temperature cook can niche jayegi? Mere saab se nahi jayegi. Chai kuch bhi karlo, ye upar hi jayegi. Ha, ham uski disha mein kadam uthare hamen uthane chahiye. Main ye nahi karna kadam nahi uthane chahiye. But it's a futile exercise. This is what I believe. <laughs> Well, you will see, Madam, tomorrow next year it will be worse. Next year, kyo kyo kyo, I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I
हिंदू जाते हैं बहुत ही हिंदू होते मुसलमान जाते हैं सारी दुनिया में मुसलमान होते हैं रोज ज्यादा मुसलमान पैदा करो हर कोई मैडम हर हिंदी बात इसलिए कहा है ये कोई भी स्कॉलर कहने को तैयार है पता नहीं क्यों बोलते ही नहीं गुंगे हो गए मर गए बोलते नहीं इसको नंगा करना चाहिए इस इश्यू को क्यों क्यों यही ये 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 इस वजह से पॉपुलेशन कम नहीं होने वाली ओके पॉइंट टेकन थैंक यू आदित्य नो डू यू वॉन्ट टू रियली वॉन्ट टू रिस्पॉन्ड हमारे देश में भी यूपी बिहार कम हो रहा है सर सर ये डिस्कशन हम बाद में कर सकते हैं अभी हम हीट के बारे में डिस्कशन कर रहे हैं और आदित्य को खत्म करने दीजिए क्योंकि हमारा टाइम नो नो योर पॉइंट हैज बीन टेकन सर योर पॉइंट हैज बीन टेकन बट नन ऑफ अस आर गोइंग टू रिजॉल्व दिस इशू ऑन दिस टेबल सो व्हाट वी कैन डू लेट्स डू दैट रिस्पॉन्ड इट्स हिज हां बिल्कुल आपका सबमिशन को ही रिस्पॉन्ड करेंगे ओके अम व्हाट आर द डिफरेंसेस बिटवीन सिटी एंड स्टेट heat action plans i'll start with the less controversial one and then and then uh, maybe move to the bigger picture right so the big differences the really big one is the inclusion of agriculture right so the, that's where the state heat action plans are lay out lay out fairly and so and that filters down to the district heat action plans um the second big differentiator is who they have staffing the heat action plan file at the state level versus the city level in the city level there's a lot of joint charge it's usually like five or six different uh, departments or representatives that come together in the state it's usually a much broader uh, state wide bureaucratic engagement right so these are the two kind of big differentiators um not always the case there are some state plans that are actually quite slim um and there are some city plans that are so i i'm just making some sort of general impressionistic statement um and so across city haps there are very big differences so between city including those four gujarat plans there's one that 16 pages uh and is primarily a public health emergency plan so vadodara for example versus say a surat or a rajkot and rajkot even has a vulnerability assessment uh amdabad of course is like the gold center so even there you see differences now question is why these differences arise i think a couple of things one is sometimes these heat action plans they're written by very different people so sometimes you have international technical consultants from the un or so on and so forth in some cases we've seen the district hospital be the lead technical consult consultant for a heat action plan right so it lets it leads to very different approaches to solving heat and very different emphases on what what needs to be done so the short term stuff um in those that are written from a public health first perspective it becomes more how do you stop lives from being lost within that particular heat wave of 5 days rather than having a sort of this big picture of how do you do an urban resilience transformation right um and so those are the sort of very big uh, differences um keep going or yeah, keep going zoom <laughs> okay we on zoom right 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 you're as though but um yeah yeah i think it's working yeah i think it's working um in terms of the actions that are being planned as part of these city haps and whether, my sense of whether they could be implemented by city governments i think the bold answer is no um because of the multi sectoral scope uh, of this and the lack of financing behind this right uh whether we then end up with an ndrf ndma
I think a huge chunk of it is a financing story. Um, in terms of the in the biggest issue in terms of the capacity, I don't think it's possible to do like a 50-50 sort of split between these two things. I think they're mutually reinforcing uh, um, uh, problems. In terms of the bureaucratic capacity bit, the main issue is most of the ULB, as far as I understand it, uh, in the three cases where we've had conversations with ULBs, don't seem to know that this heat action plan exists and how to what degree it should be implemented. So that's just a knowledge of heat kind of question. In Ahmedabad, for example, as far as we understand it, or in Bhuvaneshwar, that's a very different story because they've gone through major heat waves and they understand this is a major problem. So the implementation is a whole lot better. But I think the average Indian city, that's not the case just yet. And so that's one part of the problem. <laughs> So, okay, so the way it works is you might have, say, the health department saying this is the heat action plan and there establishes a nodal, the health officer establishes a nodal officer for the implementation of it. But then across the rest of the system, you may not actually have. So the, there's been, um, in terms of, I, this is actually an important question, whether mayors, for example, actually understand what heat is is an open question, right? So one of the district uh, officials we were talking to saying, well, actually the fact is you don't have enough buy-in from the political class in the cities, right? So the bureaucracy has a lack of understanding. There isn't a buy enough buy-in buy from the political side of it and there is no money. And so then you hit this uh, trifecta of problems when it comes to this, which is why I think this will overwhelm whatever existing capacity there is. Um, Except then in some cases, right? So I think where that political thing actually works, um, uh, I am the bad, and where there's a history of proactive governance on this, I Boneshwar, is probably a different story. So I don't want to tar the whole thing with one brush here. So that that it's very important to say is not the case, right? Um, uh, yeah, in terms of this being a futile exercise, um, I I I don't think it's a futile exercise mainly because Ten years, if we're able to have a mechanism where these heat action plans are made more robust and more implementable, it could save thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. It could solve some of the migratory pressures, for example. Lot to play for. It's not a futile exercise at all. There's some places, and even the IPCC admits, where adaptation limits have been reached, and you have to think about managed retreat. Right. So this is true, particularly of coastal erosion, for example, and flooding. Uh, so there's some areas where, yes, there will be parts of the planet that are not inhabitable, but even that is something that we should have a conversation about and how to do it, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that all is lost even in that case. Um, and coming to the population point, I think, I mean, I don't think anyone in the policy space really believes that the current population trajectory is putting us on an inevitable uh, crash course with civilizational extinction. It is not. We just need to make smart choices about how we get our energy and how we adapt, right? The overall macro trend is global population decline, including in the largest uh, countries on earth. Um, it's just about making smart policy choices. There's a lot to play for. You, we have to win every inch of territory we can get, right? So it's it's that's why I think you know saying it's futile is kind of giving up before the game has even started. Thank you, thank you, Aditya. Uh, that's a great note to end this on. 
because a lot of the climate stuff gets framed as crisis and disaster and yeah. and i think it's very important to remember that there's still a lot to play for and what and that's 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 the choice we have to make because it's not like we have we shouldn't make the choice of giving up basically so thank you everyone for being here uh, the mic's not working so it's okay i'm i've actually put on my audio oh. thank you everyone for sticking through very few but we are still here and great talk Aditya. thank you so much see you next month folks thank you